Hi. My name is Avery, and uh, as Carl said, um, I run a couple of companies. I'm from Toronto, Canada. And um, so, so just to kind of give you like a, like a quick five second background, the, the kind of the majority of the work that I do is at my company, Camp Tech. And Camp Tech runs in person, not online, imagine that, in person tech workshops for non-technical people. Our target audience are small businesses and nonprofits, which is also the kind of demographic that I was working with in a small web design studio that I used to run. But I shut that down because my side hustle, the workshop company, got much bigger than my, uh, my design studio. So I want to tell you a little bit more about some other stuff that I've been up to lately, or as I affectionately refer to it, um, when I talk about myself in the third person, which is a very strange thing to do, um, I sometimes refer to myself as being a BFD, which is a big effing deal uh, in the Canadian tech media. And I will tell you about how uncomfortable it makes me feel to refer to myself as a BFD. But before we get into that, I want to talk about the concept of whether or not self-promotion is gross. Like, show of hands, who feels like self-promotion is a little bit icky? Yeah, I'm with you, friends, okay? So like, you know, we see all of those, I don't know, it's like on LinkedIn and other tire fireplaces like that, where we see, like, people talk about building a personal brand. And like, to me, personal brand, that's like those douchebag Instagram influencers in the Fire Festival documentary, <laughs> right? Like, I'm a personal brand. Um, or you hear about how thought leadership can move the dial on your business. Um, thought leadership might be right up there as one of the nastiest business jargon terms ever. Um, it sounds a lot like mind control to me. Um, but but I, I think you probably all know what I'm talking about, that you've heard about this idea that like, if you are an expert, and side note, you do not have to be the expert, you're just an expert. Um, if you're the expert on a subject and you share ideas about that subject and people like it and you know, kind of follow you and maybe that converts into business, that whole concept is, is thought leadership, okay? It feels kind of disgusting. And you gotta remember, I'm Canadian. I'm actually technically American too, I have dual citizenship, but like, I live in Canada, I work with Canadians, I'm married to a Canadian, and in Canada especially, self-promotion is not in our blood. Like, it is a very strange thing to do. Canadians are humble, we say sorry all the time, we, you know, very much, it's all about, you know, keeping our head down and, um, do any of you have that poster in your studio or maybe in your office? You know that one that was really popular a few years ago that said, good, do good work and be nice to people? It's kind of this philosophy of like, I'm just gonna keep my head down, I'm gonna do good work for good people, and uh, you know, then other people will refer me and I'll have this great referral business, and that sounds so, so great if meritocracy was actually a real thing. Um, but unfortunately, that's not really the way that the world works all the time. So sometimes you have to kind of toot your own horn. And the thing that makes it easier for you to toot your own horn and to feel less gross about it is if you have a goal for doing so. And the goal for doing so is probably and should be closely tied to the goal for doing your work. So this goes back to your mission, to your vision. And if your PR uh, and publicity or thought leadership, all of that stuff, feeds into the same goal, then it doesn't feel so gross anymore. So if you're thinking about potentially doing some PR, thinking about doing some thought leadership, um, your goal can't really be, or at least it can't only be, to look cool. I know because that was my goal for a little bit. <laughs> the very first time I did television, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Now I get to tell everybody that I did television, including you know, like members of my family uh, and, and like extended family members that I just kind of wanted to be cooler than they are, and you know, that's a whole other like, side issue. Um, but your goal for doing publicity or PR or thought leadership can't just be about looking cool and, and looking impressive to your friends and looking like a BFD because that goal falls apart. Once it starts getting hard, that goal won't carry you through. You'll want to just quit. You know, I did TV, I think, four or five times, and then I was like, okay, cool, now I did TV, but 
What else am I going to do with it? I didn't have a goal for it. Um, but I'm going to get into that story, but I just want to kind of back it up just a little bit for you. Um, this is me uh, here in Austin at the first Owner Summit. So this was four years ago in January 2015. Um, thank you, MailChimp, for the adorable hat. Uh, looking really cute there with, uh, with my MailChimp hat on. And at that first Owner Summit, oh my gosh, friends, I was sitting like you are right now, and I was watching the people up on stage. So up on stage, Nancy fucking Lyons, Dan Maul, Greg Hoy, Andy Graham, Carl Smith. I was just sitting there like, Whoa! like stars in my eyes. Like these are all the people that I had like stalked on the internet. And I had been, you know, like reading, reading things that they had written. And I'd be like, hear about them. And I was like, oh my gosh, they're so cool. Mike Montero, epic legend, ah, right? Um, when they all talked about their work at that first owner summit, uh, sharing their ideas and insights, they were building their personal brands. And they were establishing their company's reputations and furthering their company's reputations. And the thought of getting up on stage like they had scared the crap out of me. But there was this little, little voice in the back of my head that thought, well, maybe I could do that. Maybe, just maybe. But again, it comes back to why. So let's fast forward to now um, when I put together this slide and kind of overwhelm myself because everything on this slide I've done in the last two and a half years. And let me tell you why. So after that first owner summit four years ago, um, I did get invited to go on the news in Canada. And it was an invitation that came through someone that I knew in the tech industry in Toronto. They said that on the um, uh, CTV, which is Canada's largest uh, broadcast uh, channel, it's kind of like NBC in America, CTV uh, had a news show, and on Tuesdays they did, get this, Tech Tuesdays. You see that, the alliteration? Okay, so Tech Tuesdays, this gal I knew, okay, gentlemen, there is a ladies' network, <laughs> and it is as strong as your gentlemen's network. And the ladies' network looks out for each other, in Toronto especially. And so a gal that I knew that regularly appeared as kind of the pundit, the, the guest, to comment about tech trends on Tech Tuesday couldn't make it one week. So she said, why don't you do it? And I was like, uh, blah, 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 oh, okay. So I did. I, like, you know didn't literally crap my pants, but almost crap my pants. Um, and, and I did it, and it, it went pretty well, and so then I did it again, and I did it again, and I did it again, and I did it for like four weeks in a row. And it was really fun and really cool, um, but I didn't have a goal for it. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't getting me clients, because I worked with small business. And so me going on and talking about, like this is, what was that, four years ago? So I think that I was talking about things like um, early days of like talking about drone technology. I was talking about, um, you know, some social media stuff. Like, it, it didn't directly correlate with what my clients were doing, so it didn't get me any business. And then I already had the clips to kind of share on social media, and I had my kind of ego moment. And then I was like, well, you know, they stopped calling, they moved on to somebody else, I didn't really pursue it, and that was that. But I did have another goal. I've always wanted to write a business book. And maybe some of you have wanted to write a business book as well. So my kind of like life's work, my mission, is about helping non-technical people understand technology. This is why I have a workshop company. We teach people. I wanted to write a business book that would teach a lot of the things that we teach in our workshops. So I, you know, thought about it for a long time, then, you know, procrastinated, then I came back to it, then I procrastinated some more. And in the summer of 2016, I thought, okay, I've really got to get my shit together on the book. And so I wrote up, you know, what, what would, you know, kind of be the early stages of a book proposal. A bit of an idea of like what the book would be, who it's targeted towards, why anybody would be interested, because I wanted to go after a big publishing deal. Because I wanted the book to be widely available for lots and lots of people, because I wanted to have the scale and the impact. 
So I talked to one of my friends who actually started as a client, someone that I knew that had a background in the publishing industry. She was one of my clients and we got to be friends and I said, hey, would you mind having a look at this kind of proposal that I'm, that I'm thinking of doing? And she read it and she said, this looks great. Uh, you know, I do think that a publisher would be interested in this, but nobody knows who you are. And I'm like, so? Like, again, still believing in the meritocracy lie back then. I was like, why does it matter who I am? Like, I have this company, I have this expertise, I can write this book, like, let's just get it published. It's not the way the world works, friends. So my friend said, okay, you need to go and get a platform. And I'm like, on my to-do list, go get a platform. Uh, and she's like, you need to go and be published somewhere. I'm like, go and be published somewhere. Get a byline in a magazine. Get a byline in a magazine. Go on television. And so basically she's like, become a celebrity. I'm like, okay, on the to-do list, become a celebrity. Um, so I'm like, great, what, huh, how, what, huh? Uh, but I had this goal, and the goal was that this was going to help me get a book deal, um, because this woman actually really knows a lot about what she's talking about, and then I also heard the same thing from a few other people, so I believed them. I had to go and become a celebrity so I could get a book deal. So um, I, did, I did two things. That friend from publishing, she introduced me to a friend who is the editor-in-chief of Chatelaine Magazine. Chatelaine Magazine is a women's lifestyle magazine in Canada. It's not unlike Good Housekeeping, but it is a little bit more hip. Sorry, Good Housekeeping. Um, and so she got me a coffee uh, through, through knowing the editor-in-chief. So I had a coffee with the editor-in-chief of Chatelaine, and I looked at her uh, you know, across the table, and I said, your magazine supposedly talks about all the issues facing a modern woman today, and you have no articles about technology. Technology is part of a modern woman's life. Why don't you have any articles about technology? And that stumped her for a minute, and then I followed it up with a pitch. I had this crazy idea that I would write about, <laughs> hang on, where is it? It's, uh, it's in this slide somewhere. Um, my first article in Chatelaine, that I was going to write an article about online, um, Privacy and how to protect yourself from getting a virus online, particularly if you look at porn. Right? And then I wrote it. She accepted the pitch. I wrote it. We launched it on the site. And then I had to call my dad and tell him, hey, dad, I got my first byline in a national magazine, and it's about porn. <laughs> and I wrote it in the first person. <laughs> It's a great article. You can find it online. Really, they're talking about like, hey, if you're gonna look at porn online, here's how you can kind of protect yourself. Like, you know, practice digital safe sex, you know, kind of went all those ways. Um, but it was, it was kind of the idea like, you know, how to protect yourself online in general and, you know, when you're looking at porn or, or doing anything else. Um, so that was a great success that then led to me writing a few more articles for Chatelaine. So cool, great. So I'm like, okay, I got that byline that I needed. The other thing I did at the same time was I remembered those PR and producer contacts that I had from CTV from a few years earlier when I had appeared as a pundit on the news. And my timing was pretty good because in the summer of 2016, Canada's largest morning television show was canceled. So this is the equivalent of the Today Show or Good Morning America. A beloved morning show across the country called Canada AM was canceled and they announced that they were gonna be replacing it with a fresh, young, hip, new show, and that they needed, like, you know, this wasn't like in the press release, but you could read between the lines that they were looking for fresh talent. So I emailed all the producers that I knew from the time that I had appeared on the news, and I said, who's gonna be your tech person on the morning show? And they said, well, we don't know yet. And I said, well, bring me in for an audition, and maybe I can be your tech person. I had no clue what I was doing. But I emailed them, I went in for the audition, it went pretty well, it was a bit shaky, I did it, led to me going on first, went pretty well, kept going on again and again and again, and so the majority of the kind of clips you see there are me being on the largest national television show in Canada as their resident tech correspondent. I go on about every three weeks or so, uh, I'm, on, I'm on that show. Um, and then a third thing happened, it's funny how things happen in threes and how they happen kind of close together. Um, the small business editor of the Globe and Mail. The Globe and Mail is Canada's national newspaper of record. It's the equivalent of, say, the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. A very well-respected, high-quality newspaper in Canada. The editor of the small business section 
was taking classes at my workshop company, both to learn for herself, but also to be a fly on the wall to hear what small businesses wanted to learn about digital. And I called her out, and I'm like, hey, what are you doing here? <laughs> I looked up your name, I know who you are. And she said, well, I wanna learn what small businesses wanna learn about technology. And I said, well, let's talk about it. So we you know, had a coffee, and in that coffee meeting, we were talking about a whole bunch of different you know, kind of things about um, you know, how small businesses use technology. And one thing I told her was that, because again, this was like um, fall of 2016. I said, a trend that I'm noticing in small businesses with technology is that they're interested in podcasting. And some of them are making podcasts, and it's a content marketing play. And she's like, oh, that's very interesting. I think like, we should write about that in the Globe and Mail. And I said, well, why don't I write it for you? She's like, OK. So I did. Um, and that's the article that's in the kind of bottom, bottom down there. Um, and then that led to more writing in the Globe and Mail. So I tell you all of this to say, like, this is, this is some of the stuff that I've done um, so that I can tell you all the things that I've learned along the way. So, Let's get back to this idea of the goal. This is the number one thing I want you to take away from my presentation. It's asking yourself, what do you want to be known for? Something really, really worth thinking about. Um, when, you, when you know what you want to be known for, and when you have a goal, then chasing publicity doesn't feel so gross anymore. I knew that I had my two goals, that I wanted to raise my profile enough that I could get a book deal, and I knew that I wanted to be known as the woman who talks about technology in an accessible way for non-technical people. A very similar question to what do you want to be known for is what do you, what do you want to be your legacy? This is like, we're getting deep here, friends. I know you're like, shit, I just ate lunch. I just wanted to take a nap, okay? But what do you want to be your legacy? And a legacy is a body of work that goes beyond you. If you're lucky, it outlives you. Um, what are you creating that is bigger than yourself? And you might be like, okay, come on. I just, you know, I do good work for good people. I make WordPress websites and I get to take a nice vacation in the summer, but I'm not gonna let you off the hook with that kind of answer. Because I think if you're here today, if you were able to take time away from your business, you spent a few dollars to get here, this, like, this is the A team, okay? The A team doesn't get away with just putting their heads down and doing good work for good people. The A team, as something they want to be known for. Because I think you all have a vision, and I think you all have missions. And maybe you haven't solidified them and written them down yet, and if you haven't, I want you to go and talk to Tom Barrett, or Tracy Barrett, or Nancy Lyons, and ask them about how do you solidify your mission, and then it will become your goal and your North Star, and it will change your life. When you're working in PR and publicity specifically, uh, and I had to learn that, that they're not the same thing. I always thought that PR and publicity were the same thing. They're not. PR is everything that you do that's kind of outward facing towards, um, you know, it's, it's your reputation, it's what uh, people think about you, it's your brand, it's, you know, the, the stuff that you might write about, it might be your speaking, et cetera. Publicity is specifically media, okay? So if you are interested in potentially going after media and publicity, you really, really, really need to hold on to your goal and remember what your goal is. Because in publicity, there are larger than life personalities and they will pull you along into their goals. So PR representatives from companies, they wanna promote their clients. Producers and editors, they want the scoop for eyeballs and for clicks. No one will protect your goal unless you protect it yourself. So the example I have with this is, um, you know, once word kind of got out that I was a tech correspondent, a bunch of PR people added me to their databases and to uh, into their list. So I get bombarded with emails, phone calls. You know, it, it sounds very glamorous, but it's, it's kind of not at times. Um, you know, I get, like, seriously, 
stuff just appears at my door. I get gifts, I, I get sent on press trips. It's kind of cool, but it's also a bit weird sometimes. Um, and the PR rep, a, a wonderful person, but also she's very, very good at her job, so she is frickin' pushy. A PR rep from a very large tech brand um, kept pushing on me to do more work in the space of parenting and technology. Write more articles about parenting. Write more articles about, like, I'm a mother. I have a child. So write more articles about what it's like to raise a child in, in the tech space. Now, she wasn't wrong. Like, it would be kind of cool. You know, I could write those pieces. And I did write one piece for, you know, the large parenting magazine in Canada. But really, it took me a while to realize she wasn't pushing me on my goal. My goal is talking to non-technical adults about tech. My jam is not parenting and parenting technology. Um, I realized that it was her goal because her company makes products for kids to learn how to code. So at first I thought, oh, you know, it was like we have mutual goals. We're both moving towards the, you know, the promotion of both things. But no, 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 no. At the end of the day, everybody has their own interests. So if you're interested in pursuing publicity, you have to really, really, really know what your interests are. OK, you ready to get real? Let's talk about fears. There have been so many things that terrify me in all of this work that I've been doing. And maybe they terrify you, too. So let me know if any of these sound familiar. Um, you have to have an opinion. <laughs> this is equal parts obvious and completely like, like frightening. Um, I've never been a person that's been short on opinions, but I usually have opinions in safe spaces. I have opinions amongst my friends and family. Any of you like opinionated people? Come on, show of hands. I know, yeah, we've got some opinions, right? You've got opinions. But the thing about having an opinion in public is that your opinion goes places that you cannot go. So what I mean by this is every time I write for my column in the newspaper, I have to have an opinion. It would be it would, like, what kind of columnist doesn't have an opinion? It would be really, really boring to read my writing if you couldn't see where I was going with it. Every time I go on television and I say, I think this is a good product, I think this maybe not so much. Um, whenever I talk about things, my opinion goes out into the world and I don't get to go along with it. I don't get to stand over the shoulder of somebody reading something that I've written and say, Oh, what was it? No, no, no. What I actually meant by that was da, 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 da. or or oh, you oh, well, da, 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 da. like you, you don't get you don't get to have those follow up conversations. Um, and you know, I talked about writing a book is one of my goals. Right now, I am like in the manuscript process right now of, of finalizing the manuscript, and this is what is terrifying the crap out of me at the moment. I literally called a friend last week and asked her if the definition of a word is the same thing as my understanding of the de definition of a word, because I was so so afraid afraid that I was going to say something wrong, and that then it would go into print, and then I wouldn't be able to back it up or change it. This is absolutely terrifying. Another big fear I've had in speaking up and putting myself out there is that what I want to say has been said by others. This held me back for a good, like, two years. Um, I have a business coach. I highly recommend you get one. They're pretty great. Um, I've been seeing my business coach every month for seven years. It's like therapy. It's fantastic. Um, and so she knows me pretty well. And she knows how I sometimes use fear to like get out of things. Uh, and so when I talk to her about this fear, she say, hey, I want, I want you to put yourself out there. I want you to you know, make your opinions known. I want you to work on that book. Um, I would say, well, no. Mike Montero already wrote, you're my favorite client. I don't, like, that was kind of maybe an idea I had, like, talking to clients. Yeah, no, I was like, no, Mike already wrote that. Uh, you know, Dan's written a pretty good book. I read it. Jody, I can't wait to read your book, although I don't think I could write that one. Um, and my business coach called bullshit on this. She said, I want you to go to the bookstore, and I want you to go to the cooking book section, and I want you to look at all the cookbooks that are Italian cookbooks that have recipes for spaghetti and meatballs. 
I'm not much of a cook, so I can't totally comment here, but I think there are a lot of spaghetti and meatball recipes, and I'm not totally sure if the world needs another one. But that's not stopping anybody from making more cookbooks with spaghetti and meatball recipes. Just because something has been said does not mean you cannot say it as well. Because you probably have a different way of saying it. You can maybe say it at the right time, maybe when somebody really needs to hear it. Or, another thing my business coach said to me, she did this on purpose, she tried to get me riled up. She said, okay, Avery, fine, fine. It's all been said before, right? Cool. You just, you just go back into your, you know, your house and just don't come out and hibernate and you know, don't share your opinions with the world. Um, but you know if you don't, then those guys over there are gonna share their opinions. And do you agree with their opinions? And I'd be like, no, what that guy says is wrong. Or that guy's a jerk. I don't like how he says that. And she'd be like, well, then it's up to you. You have to go out there and speak up. Because if I don't fill that space, someone else will. And I might not necessarily agree with how they're filling the space. When I started doing uh, publicity and, and media work uh, in Canada two and a half years ago, this is the landscape. These are the faces of Canadian tech journalism and reporting. Look proportional to you? All these white guys on the left, some of them are wonderful people, and I like them very, very much. And they're very, very smart, and they have some great things to say. But holy shit, is their opinion overrepresented. The line on the right is the one woman that does TV, the one woman that's on the public broadcast or on the radio, the one woman who writes, and the one visible minority that's on television. WTF. This got me really mad. Because this made me realize that if we are talking about technology as a society, we are talking about big things. I don't know if you've heard about what's going on in Toronto right now, but Google wanted to build a village and harvest all the data from people that live there and own that private, uh, that, that private data. And people were like, yeah, okay, that sounds like a good idea. Like, what? So if all of these nice but white guys are the ones who are talking about technology in the most multicultural city in the world. Why do we only have white guys talking about technology to people who are more than just white guys? This got me pissed off. And so now I'm mentoring a young woman who's a woman of color. And every time I don't get a tech gig, like a media gig, she's the first person I call because I want her to sit in the seat if I can't be there to sit in the seat. Because these are great people, but oh my gosh, they've already had too much to say. The biggest fear I have ever had, and I am having it so bad right now, is who am I to be telling anyone what to do? This is the imposter syndrome. For anyone who's never had imposter syndrome, it can be very hard to understand. It at it fundamentally does not make sense. It is not logical. Imposter syndrome is when you feel or you see that people outside of you might think that you're accomplished, or they may give you accolades for something that you have done, or they may say like, hey, yeah, that's pretty cool. You're on TV, you're a BFD. But you on the inside, you do not think you are deserving of that recognition. You do not think that you're a BFD. So the way that your brain rationalizes these two truths is usually one of two ways. Number one, it's that, well, yeah, I did do that, but I was just lucky. I was just lucky. I was lucky because my friend knew the editor-in-chief of Chatelaine Magazine, and that's how I, how I got all my writing in Chatelaine Magazine and then I wrote for another magazine because that person knew that person. I was lucky because they just happened to need a new tech correspondent on the morning show. It has nothing to do with me being pretty good at my job. It's just luck. Or you rationalize it by thinking, okay, I got that gig. I don't know how, but somehow I got that gig and I guess I did pretty good, but they don't know that I really can't do that, 
and one day they're gonna find me out. So then you have this fear that you're going to be found out as a fraud or as an imposter. And you add that fear on top of all of the totally rational, normal fears of putting yourself out there and being afraid you don't have anything to say and wondering if your nails look good and if this is still a hip color or not. And that you are so exhausted. This fear is so exhausting. I cannot even tell you, like I'm, like, I'm not even joking. I'm having imposter syndrome so bad right now. That's why I'm just running my mouth. Um, but this is what helps. What helps is talking about it and knowing that other people, badass people, have felt fear and imposter syndrome just like I do, and they still do stuff. Georgia O'Keeffe, the legendary painter, said that she's been absolutely terrified every moment of her life, and she never let it keep her from doing a single thing she wanted to do. Talk about a legacy. In her fantastic autobiography, Bossy Pants, Tina Fey talks about having fear and imposter syndrome. And she figured that whenever a new opportunity presented itself to her, she would just say yes. And then she would just figure it out afterwards. After she said that, that became my mantra. Every time someone would say, can you come on TV today? Just say yes. Figure it out afterwards. Building on that idea, the uh, best-selling author and activist Glennon Doyle said that after each yes, she prepares. She says that once she accepts an invitation, she tries hard to make herself worthy of it. And isn't that such a beautiful idea? That's the idea of kind of rising to reach the, the expectation. It does get a little bit easier. The more time I speak, the more appearances I make, the more stuff I do, the fear gets a little bit smaller, but it never actually goes away. And you know what? I'm kind of glad it doesn't go away. Does anybody know what the opposite of imposter syndrome is? Shout it out if you do. Narcissist, yes, it has a psych psycho, psycho something, psychological whatever term. Anybody know what it's called? Dunning-Kruger, thank you ladies, because of course you're the ones that know what it is because you've done the work on this. Mm. Side note, um, it was first thought that more high-performing women than men felt imposter syndrome, but that's now starting to change. Men are becoming more comfortable talking about it. So imposter syndrome is not just a woman's problem. Gentlemen get it too. But anyway, the opposite of imposter syndrome is called the Dunning-Kruger effect, and it's basically being a douchebag. <laughs> Dunning-Kruger is the exact opposite. It's when you think that the outs uh, it's when you think internally that your accomplishments are better than the outside perception of your accomplishments. And it makes you a raging, big-headed, egomaniac, megalomaniac like, you know, jerk, right? So I would rather be a little bit on the side of imposter syndrome than on the Dunning-Kruger side. So that's why I'm kind of okay with having these fears, because it's not stopping me. My daughter is showing early signs of childhood anxiety. She's learning how to ski this winter, and it's scaring the crap out of her. But I'm coaching her through it and teaching her that she doesn't have to do amazing every single week. She just has to keep showing up. It has been the most humbling experience to try and teach her that you feel the fear, but you still go out and do it. There's a few things that I've learned along the way from doing all of this publicity stuff. So um, here comes all the practical tips. You're like, when's she gonna stop talking about her feelings and get to the real goods? Here we go. Um, you have to ask for what you want. You can't wait for an invitation. Okay, again, if the world was a meritocracy, this would be great. You could, uh, you know, just, people would just know that you're awesome, but that's not the way the world works. So you make a hit list. You know, you think like, what is my goal for PR and publicity? And who do I want to reach out to? Where do I want to appear? Where do I want to be interviewed? You make a hit list of the names of those journalists and those reporters, uh, and then you go and you reach out to them. When you reach out to them, a warm intro can go a lot further than a cold email. 
I said earlier that I'm now on uh, press databases. Uh, so publicists and, and PR people from around the world now pitch me regularly on whatever the heck they're trying to, like, the best is like, I got a pitch like a couple weeks ago um, for uh, a sump pump that like pumps out basements. And I'm like, what in my body of work as a tech correspondent makes you think I would ever cover your sump pump? It wasn't Bluetooth, it wasn't smart. Like it was, it was just literally like a sump pump for when your basement overflows. No. Um, I get hundreds, I'm not even kidding, hundreds of emails a day from PR people pitching me, and I don't even open the emails because it's just overwhelming. I can't, I have a day job. Um, so if you know someone who knows someone, this is where LinkedIn actually is kind of handy. You know, you can do that six degrees of Kevin Bacon thing um, where you can, you can find someone who might know someone who might know someone. Um, this is also sometimes where it can help to hire PR. Um, and if any of you are here in the room are, are PR people, um, sometimes a PR person can know who to reach or who, who to approach. But I do think that, that it's helpful to kind of go for the, the warm intro as much as you can. And if you are working with a PR person, that doesn't mean that you get to just like be hands off and be like, oh yeah, PR, we got that taken care of. We have Cindy over there. You know, Cindy's doing our PR. Why are PR people always women? Anyway. Um, if you are going to be interviewed for a net magazine or another industry publication or something like that, you can talk about JavaScript libraries, okay? Totally cool. But if you're gonna be interviewed for TV, for a mainstream newspaper or something, you cannot talk about JavaScript libraries. You might not even be able to talk about web design and development if that's what you do. Um, you may have to do what I did, which at first was like, ugh, I talk about consumer technology and I talk about tech industry trends. I talk more about like Facebook's Q4 earnings call than I ever thought I would want to or care to, to be honest. Um, but if you can talk about things that are around your industry, this is how you can uh, send publicity back to your business. So my example that I have for this is my friend Amanda. Amanda owns a company in Toronto called The Workaround. The Workaround is a co-working space that has an on-site childcare. And maybe in your communities or cities, you have things like that. But for some ungodly reason, Toronto is the fourth largest city in North America, and we never had one until Amanda started it. So whenever there is news about any topic that has to do with parenting in the workforce, Amanda is a go-to expert for, uh, for newspapers and television in Toronto. So for example, our, uh, our you, know, you know our hot prime minister, Justin Trudeau, right? Um, they've been talking about making change. Oh my gosh, all you Americans, you're just gonna weep at this. In Canada, they're making the, uh, the parental leave go from a year to a year and a half <laughs> because a year's not long enough. <laughs> um, so, you know, talking about what that means and what that means for the workforce, there's Amanda talking about what it means for parenting in the workforce. In Ontario, my home province, there has been talk about changes to the kindergarten system. Uh, and whenever we're talking about changing uh, kindergarten and what age kids can be when they go to kindergarten and how long kindergarten should go, there's Amanda in the newspapers, on TV, because it has to do with parenting in the workforce. Because if kids can't go to kindergarten all day like they can right now, then who's gonna pick them up at 12.30? I'm not. I'm on TV. <laughs> I can't go get my kid at 12.30. Uh, so, so Amanda has been able to, to really be a go-to person for something that is a bit bigger than her actual business. But every time she does appear in the media, they say this is Amanda Monday from The Workaround. So she's getting that kind of name brand going along with her with every part of the message. Where are we out of time? Okay, here we go. If you do get a request to be interviewed for the media, you have to respond right away. I'm talking within 30 minutes max. For those of you with jobs, <laughs> that is a very hard thing to do. If you have a healthy relationship with your inbox where maybe you only check it a few times a day, you might be too late to get media requests. Um, because if you don't respond within the first 30 minutes, they're gonna move on to somebody else. And when you respond, 
All they need to know right away is whether or not you're in. It's just a quick, yep, I'm interested. And then you can work out the details. Okay, where do I have to go? What time is it gonna be? What do I need to wear? Do I have to brush my hair? You know, da 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 But if you don't respond right away, you're gonna miss it. If that is too short of a timeline for you, if you're like, no way, I do not want to be on call like that, um, then maybe pursue news that has a, um, a longer cycle, like print. You know, print is online now, but you know what I mean. Like, like, go after the newspapers, the magazines. But TV and radio, they really need to hear from you, like, right away. So whether or not you can, uh, you can participate. This is a little trick that I've learned that I want to share with you. If you're in the middle of, a, of an interview, and you can kind of tell maybe where the journalist or the, or the interviewer is going, but it might not necessarily be where you want to go, you can do these kind of linguistic things. Like you can say like, great question, I'm going to answer that. But the question I really wish you had asked me was, da 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 right? It's like how you can kind of navigate things a little bit. Because you're going to go into that interview being prepared, right? You're not just going to wing it. You're going to have an idea of what your goal is for that particular interview, the one key message you hope to get across. You're not going to be able to get across five key messages, but if you're lucky, you'll be able to get across one key message. Like Amanda is always trying to say, I know about parents in the workforce. I run a co-working space that has an on-site child care. I know about the flexibility that modern parents need, that modern working parents need. It's the only message she really needs to get across. So you can kind of, you, you, you can change the direction of an interview a little bit. A really practical TV tip is to plant your feet. A friend of mine told me this the very first time I was on television. She had some media experience, and she said, when you go and sit in the chair in the newsroom, take 30 seconds to just get comfortable in the chair and plant your feet, and then do not move your feet. Because if you move your feet, then the rest of your body starts to kind of fidget, and then you look a little strange. Um, also, talk with your hands if you're on television, um, but not wildly. You know, if you're on stage and you've got great bell sleeves, like look at these, just beautiful. You know, you can, you can flap like a bird and you can, and you can gesticulate quite wildly when you speak uh, in person, but when you're on television, you don't want to be stiff, but you want to keep your hands kind of within like this space right here. You can kind of do a little bit of this, a little bit of this, you know, it feels very strange, but you know, it kind of gets, gets some movement in your body, right? Um, people ask me all th this all the time, <laughs> like, what should I wear if I'm on TV? So this is your answer. Um, wear solid colors when in doubt. Jewel tones are beautiful. Um, avoid small patterns or stripes, like even just this little pattern that I have here on this top would be a little bit tricky on some cameras. Um, and unless you are AOC rocking a white cape at the State of the Union, you cannot wear white on television. It just does not look good. Um, it reads really strange, so avoid white. If you're being interviewed for radio or even a podcast, unless you are talking about the most serious of serious subjects ever, smile every once in a while when you talk. It comes through in your voice and, and the emotion is there. Um, you want to do everything you can to make it easy for them to invite you back. Journalists are not lazy. Producers are not lazy, but they are usually under insane time constraints. So they will go to who they know. If they interviewed you once and you were good, they will probably call you back again. Or, I swear to gosh, guys, this really does happen. One of those white guys you saw on that slide, he, like, emails me every time he needs to talk to a small business digital expert. And I'm going to put Adam Green on the spot in the back because you know who I sent you to. Yeah. Article for the Globe and Mail. A journalist that doesn't know anybody that specializes in search engine marketing and SEO. Oh, I know that guy. I sent him to you. But only because I couldn't think of a woman of color first. <laughs> um, if you make it easy for them to invite you back, you are not just on time, you're early. You prepare talking points. And then at the end, you say to them, hey, thanks so much. It was really great being the person that you talked to about the impacts of the GDPR on this particular industry. But did you also know that 
I can talk about FinTech or you know, whatever your jam is because they, they will only know that you can talk about what you just talked about. You need to let them know the other things that you can potentially talk about. And then you can, you can send follow-up emails, they'll probably fall on deaf ears, but you, know, you can remind them every once in a while, this is who I am and this is what I can talk about. Okay, the number one question that I always get asked, and, uh, and this is maybe what you were waiting for, is how you do or do not get paid when you do publicity. So, in general, you will probably not get paid in dollars, in like cash money, okay? Um, there's very little cash money in media, period. Um, so they, they lean hard on people doing appearances for free. So if you're gonna be a guest on the news, uh, you know, being like a pundit or, you know, kind of a go-to expert for the news or um, even, you know, like the newsroom side of um, like a newspaper, you're not gonna get paid in cash money. If it's a newspaper though, or even if it is a television thing or radio, ask them if they have an online version and if they can include a link back to you. Because then you get paid in SEO, which is sometimes more valuable than money if you have that nice link back coming to, to you or to your site. Um, I get paid for being a regular tech correspondent on the morning show. You wanna know how much? Like, yes I do. Um, I get paid 300 Canadian dollars per appearance. That's like 200 American dollars. That pays for my nails and my dress and like maybe one fifth of a shoe, <laughs> okay? Um, so, and then also when you calculate like how much time I spend preparing, you know, all the follow-up, the actual doing, all of that kind of stuff, like I'm actually losing money <laughs> by regularly being on television, but you gotta remember, it all comes back to that goal, that goal I had, and the goal for doing publicity is not to make money directly. Um, there have been very few instances where someone has said to me, I saw you on television, I want to hire you, or I want to hire your company. It could also be because of what I talk about. Like I said, I talk about consumer electronics a lot, and I talk about tech trends. I do have random people stop me in coffee shops and say, I saw you on TV, can you help me with my iPhone? And then I'm like, oh, come on. Sometimes I will, though. Um, I do get paid in stuff. I get review products. I don't get to keep them, but I do get extended loans. Um, that laptop is an extended loan from Apple. My Apple Watch is an extended loan uh, while I'm reviewing and, and getting to know the products. I do have to give them back eventually. I don't get to keep them. Um, I do get to go on press trips, which is kind of fun. I like to travel, so that kind of helps that with me. But, um, but you, you, my, my kind of point is that you're not gonna make money. So if you're not gonna make money, then how do you leverage the experience so that it can actually move the needle in your business? And um, this is about mostly leveraging content and leveraging the experience after it's over. So if you've been interviewed uh, you know, in a newspaper or magazine, if you've been on a radio show, um, your gut instinct is gonna be to run to social media and be like, ah, look at me, I'm a celebrity. Um, that's fine and cool, I do it. You know, Carl said he follows me on social and I'm always bragging about doing this or that. Um, but it's not really gonna be what, what gets you the business, right? Um, it, that's just kind of ego show off kind of stuff. Um, what will actually get you the business is if you can tell your clients or your customers or your target clients that that's what you do, that you've been recognized externally as an expert. And the person I know that does this really well in my world is um, my independent financial planner. Uh, this guy that, that manages the like $5 that I have in my retirement fund. Um, he regularly appears on Bloomberg Business Television in Toronto. And uh, his office sends out a plain text email the day before it happens, because they get you know, advance notice. The guy's name is Bruce. So it'll say, Bruce is gonna be the guest on Bloomberg Business TV at five o'clock tomorrow. I never tune in, because I don't really like watching Bloomberg Business TV. But I notice that that email went out, and I notice that Bruce is doing it, and it does make me think, I'm so glad that the guy that's looking after the $5 I have in my retirement fund is the guy 
that's going on and talking about this stuff on Bloomberg Business TV because he probably has an idea of, you know, what he's talking about. Um, what's kind of strange to me about talking about this with you today is that I'm at a crossroads. I don't really know what I'm doing next in terms of PR and publicity. I told you that my goal was to get a book deal, and I did. And now I'm working on the manuscript, and my book is coming out in January 2020 because that's how long it takes to publish a book. Uh, Carl, maybe that'll be a future owner summit topic. Uh, but right now, I've achieved that goal. So it's like on the to-do list, become a celebrity, check. Get a book deal, check. Now I have to go through the crazy process of actually doing the book. But now it's, it's kind of coming around to a point where I'm like, I'm not exactly sure what I'm gonna do next with all of this stuff. Um, I was talking to my husband, uh, you know, about a month ago, and I said, you know, I, I really like writing my column in the Globe and Mail. That is the closest thing I have to what I actually do professionally. But the morning TV thing, if it disappeared tomorrow, if they just stopped calling and said, you know, we don't want to do tech segments anymore, I don't know if I would replace it. I don't know if I would go out and chase other morning shows and, and other outlets. I might just let it go because I've already reached that goal. I do still have my, you know, my big mission of talking about tech, about tech in a non-technical way to reach everyday people. Um, but I'm, I, I'm just going to kind of have to let you know like what I end up doing here. Um, it's been a really fun ride. I've been able to kind of like, um, <laughs> there's this really crazy like indie Canadian movie, maybe some of you have seen it, it's called FUBAR. Uh, and in FUBAR the guys say, um, uh, turn up the good, turn down the suck. And so <laughs> in my media work I have been able to maximize for what I enjoy the most. I've been able to maximize the press trips and the, you know, having fun and meeting people and getting to play with gadgets and, and cool things like that. And I've been able to minimize some of the stuff that I don't like doing as much. Like there's certain subjects that I just don't really want to talk about on air. Um, so I think I'm going to kind of do that a little bit more. Like, you know, just keep, keep tweaking it for, for what I want. But um, I, I'm just going to have to let you know uh, what, what's next for me. And you can follow along. You can, you know, catch up with me later. What are we at? 2.24? Yeah. So, I don't know, Carl, you want to just cut it, or should we do some questions? We can do a question or two. Uh, hey, that was great. Um, I was just wondering, um, there are a lot of white men in this room and a lot I of us didn't might, notice. yeah we may actually be imposters uh what yeah. can we do to make room for people that don't look like us to take those spaces yeah for sure um the number one thing i think you can do is whenever an opportunity comes up ask and this, this one's kind of uh this one's great for speaking if you've ever been asked to speak or to present somewhere, just ask who else is speaking. Who else has been invited? Um, you know, and there's all these people that, that said like no more manals, like no more male panels, like all male panels. Um, but if you just ask like who else is speaking, and if it's like nothing but a bunch of white guys, then would you be willing to give up your spot? Or would you be willing to, um, to say like, hey, that's not cool with me. Uh, we need to make some room here for visible minorities or, or for women or for the, the rainbow of all different types of diversity that there, there are out there. Um, and if need be, I will shorten my talk or I will like even withdraw my name completely. Yeah, it's, um, I, I really believe in this style of feminism and gentlemen, I know you can be feminists too. It's, um, it's the idea that the second I get a seat at the table or the second I get somewhere, the first thing I do is turn around and look behind me. I'm like, who am I going to bring along? Because to me, and this is like, now we're getting way philosophical, friends, success is not a finite resource. My success is not diminished by somebody else's success. So if I get some success, there is more than enough to go around. I can be successful, you can be successful. We can have, we can have like, like a kick-ass success party. We're all gonna be successful. But 
if I get a moment where I'm like, cool, yeah, great opportunity, mm, you come in with me, you come in with me, you mm, just stay there for a minute, okay? I love men, I'm married to one, but you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, hi, Barry, thanks for the talk. Maybe, yeah, maybe it's a boring question, but um, how do you, have you tried to es estimate uh, return on investment of your publicity? I mean, maybe not in numbers, but yeah. could you tell maybe like more how it helps your you know, business grow and you know, what's, how life, how's your life changed after getting this publicity? Thanks. Yeah, um, and there, there's, there's a bit of a misconception there about like how, how does um, getting publicity change? Um, does it actually get more business? In my case, no. My like profit and loss, my actual like, like when I look at like the clients that I have, et cetera, it has not changed at all since I've been on TV. Um, and that's why I'm actually kind of okay if it just disappears because I was very clear with my goal and my goal was because publishers think it's important to be on TV. Um, <laughs> little do they know. Um, but I, I do think that there is a, a, like an awareness thing as well though and, and, it's and it can be very, very hard to quantify but I do think that there, there is some value in kind of brand awareness and you know, if, if you can potentially get your company name out there. Um, like my friend Amanda who runs the workaround, like she is seeing a, a kickback, she is seeing more traffic to her website, she is seeing um, you know, more people being interested in potentially joining her co-working space because she's out there in the media. So especially if you're um, even in the, the earlier stages of a venture or launching a new product, that's when it can help as well. Yeah. One more, we got time for one more. If anybody's got something, yes, no, no. You have answered all the things. Beautiful, thank you. Good job.